Well, um, I suppose now that you've got some food in front of you, some wine in your, in, in your hands, it's time for us to, um, to start this masterclass with one of the most exciting young chefs um, in Australia. He's also a, win a runner-up in the, um, in the 2014 Ap Alexis Appetite of Excellence Awards. And in 2015, he was named Australia's best young chef in those awards. So he's gone from the, the silver medal to the gold medal. So please welcome Jake Kelly. Technique-wise, my philosophy as well on cooking is very technique-driven. I think, you know, a lot of chefs, you know, tend to get caught up quite a bit on techniques and how to cook meat, sous vide this, and all this kind of stuff. This meat you're going to eat tonight is purely roasted at 110 degrees for an hour, and that's it. It's not complicated, it's not hard, um, and that's how it's cooked. We're serving that with a little pickled walnut puree, uh, shiitake, shiitake ketchup from the hot waste, um, and we've also got a potato crisp and some smoked bone marrow. So what we'll do, we'll kick off, I want to show you guys how to cook the meat, because I think that's a big thing that people get a little bit confused about, is how do I cook beef? Well, it's interesting you, you, you talk about cooking meat the, the traditional way, because I've noticed like, quite a few young chefs are kind of turning their back on the, the sous vide machine now, and actually just, you know, I mean, it's fine for fish, but for meat it's kind of like, you know, the, the straight heat's what you want. But this kind of purely produce-driven cooking, where people are just looking at finding a great carrot and roasting it, putting it on a plate. It's kind of not enough anymore. The, 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 we're going back to a period where, where chefs are expected to show technique. The, the, you know, making a custard and, and cooking the meat traditionally and doing the, the proper skills is something that's, that's valued again now. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's what I try to innovate on my cooking. I don't, I don't like getting caught up in those kind of stuff. I just stick natural and, and cook naturally. So I'm going to show you how you guys seal off the meat. You know, hopefully the smoke alarms are off. And basically it's warming this pan up nice and hot. Because you want that sear. You want to get that nice brown around the meat. Rum cap is something that, that we've started to see, especially with, with Wagyu in the last few years. Um, it's obviously a, a big cap cut in the uh, middle of California. I mean, it's, it's, an old, it's, an old, it's an old gaucho cut. And the way we tend to cook it on a nice temperature, it retains its moisture um, quite heavily. And you'll notice that in the dish you get tonight. That it's beautiful and juicy like th that's just resting in the oven it cooked about two hours ago and you'll see the moisture come out in a lot and the butter the butteriness so you can just see it's rendering down it's starting to get a little bit of color with, 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 with Wagyu what are you uh, are you looking at a, a, a medium a medium rare or, or well done I mean it's a, it's forgiving in terms of the fat but, but where, do, where do you like to what question do you like to take it to I like to take it to medium rare I think you know, rare to medium, medium rare. I think it's still you still get the grains and meat. It's quite still chewy. Don't like Wagyu says it's supposed to melt in your mouth and all this kind of stuff. You still got to cook it properly to get that result. Um, and I think cooking it slow, break down all the fibres. Um, I think that's when you get the butteriness and the, and the Wagyu starts to shine. So I'm just searing that off on the bottom part. I've just got an oven just preheated at about 110. So I'm just going to get a nice good golden colour on this, and it will pop it in the oven, and that will take about. An hour, an hour and fifteen. Well, one thing to do. I heard a, I had a terrible story about an ex MasterChef contestant, one of our weaker cooks, who his new thing is been doing um, videos on testing the the cuisson of chicken. He sticks a he sticks a, a, a knife in, and then he actually licks it, like puts on his tongue rather <laughs> his lips. So it's like you're missing the point. If the chicken's undercooked, you just <laughs> you've just totally messed it up. So yeah, bo bottom of the lip, so you can you can feel that temperature. There we go. So That's great. You see that nice nice roasted colour there now. So we just hit the sides. It, it's a great thing about those about those induction. I, I got I got induction put in, and, and the that heat transference it gets so hot so quick. It's amazing for searing searing meat. Yeah, it does. Never used it before, and today I was searing the beef. I didn't realise how hot they got. Oh, yeah, a litre <laughs> of water will boil in a minute. It's amazing. It's good. It's fantastic. So just in this other pan, so I'm going to show you guys how to make the pickle walnut puree. You might not necessarily do these at home, and you might not have necessarily seen pickled walnuts before. All right, so there we go. So I would say perfect sear. You guys can see that. So beautiful roasted, and now just simply we're just going to pop that in the oven. Come on. Let's probe that to the centre. So we probe that to 52. Awesome. So yeah, low and just low temperature, 52 degrees. Mm -hmm. Let it rest out in the oven. Turn the oven off. Open the door ajar, and yeah, it cooks through beautifully. So this is the pickled walnut puree. So I'm going to make a lyonnaise of onions. So lyonnaise being 
just literally roasted onions, take it down to real caramelization, hit it really hard. And then these are the pickled walnuts. So your whole walnuts, been pickled, just got these from one of our nice dry sauce suppliers called Sensel. And basically just going to chop that up when these hit a nice good colour, put them in, cook that out, a little bit of water, and then add a little bit of vinegar back in, and then we'll puree it. So we just keep this roasting down. So in the other pan, I'm going to show you how to make this shiitake ketchup. So what we'll do is hit these in the pan. And basically we're just going to sweat that down so they come nice and caramelised. And what we'll do is that we're going to get a bit of vinegar in there. So you create some acid for the dish. You're in, in dishes and when we create dishes at sell, you always want to find that balance. Sweet, sour, savoury, acid. And then it creates that moisture and, and that in your, in your mouth that you want to go back for more. So then that's what this dish is about. So I reckon we could take it a bit more, but we'll speed up a bit. So onions take a little bit further with the walnuts in there. So I'm literally just going to get these and crush them with my hands. And we'll cook it out. Cook the walnuts out. Add a touch of water in there. And cook it out for probably about 10 to 15 minutes. A little bit of moisture. So we just want to get rid of that moisture. And then we'll hit it a bit with a bit of red wine vinegar. And then this is just like it. So all that moisture from the mushrooms are gone. It's starting to become nice and golden brown. It's going to add a bit of red wine vinegar. So, so with, 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 a, with a meat like Wagyu, which is naturally kind of fatty or richer, are you looking at amping up the, um, the amount of acid in the, in the dish in order to kind of balance against it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, is when you'll taste the walnut puree, it's quite quite high in acid, but obviously the walnuts have been pickled. Um, and then you've got the, the mushrooms in there as well, and you've got the fattiness, and you've got the butteriness of the beef. You, you want to find that balance so it's not, you eat it, then you go, then you want to fall asleep. All right, to this pan, I hit it with a little bit of red wine vinegar, get the acid in there, and it also poured in a little bit of Worcestershire sauce, house-made barbecue sauce, and a little bit of maple syrup. So we're going to create a little bit of sweetness, sweet, acid. So you can see that sticking right up now. So I'm just going to turn that off if I know how to. Add a little bit more water to this pot. So we'll let that cook out for a bit longer and then we'll transfer that and blitz it. So, so there, there, there's really, it's really just finding an unusual or, or lesser known ingredient like the, um, like the walnuts in that sauce that makes the sauce stand out. Because you're not, you're not, you're not in terms of what you put in there, it's a pretty straightforward yeah, combination. Yeah, it's just it? a lean haze of onions and pickled walnuts. You know, you're getting, you know, you so you're going to get, you know, high sweetness in the onions, and you uh, counteract that with a lovely pickled walnut puree. So essentially, from this stage, I have prepared all this before, um, before I come tonight, but I just wanted to show you. The the fundamentals of it all. So in this pan here, from the pan, I've just chilled it down in the, in, in the fridge, and then I've chopped it by hand with a knife, and that's the result. So you literally, we just get some nice quenelles of that on the plate. The puree, I've just busted out in the thermo. I won't do it, it's quite loud. And just puree it so it's nice and smooth. Probably add a little bit of water, um, just to finish it out. But that's it there, you can see it's nice and smooth. I don't know if you guys have seen it, probably not, but there's a thing called a Japanese mandolin. Mm. <laughs> and chefs are quite fond of it these days because you can turn a vegetable into a crisp or you know, people at, at an ESP next door, or they roll it up, obviously peel it down, the potato or whatever, and we put it in this machine where it has a, rod, a metal rod on one side and the plastic on the other side. And basically what it does, it twirls, it turns, and then you hold the blade and it, and it ribbons out. Mm. Because instead of so using a normal mandolin like this, yeah. you're getting the full rotisserie of the vegetable. Mm. And what I've done is then cut that into sheets and then fry it at a low temperature and you get a potato crisp. Bone marrow, I've got it in split, so I've actually kept a bit to show you guys. So I've got, I've got I, I, I'm, 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 I love this stuff, I think it's amazing. Who, who here cooks with bone marrow? Hands up if you cook with bone marrow. It, it, for me, this is, this is, this is, our, this is our foie gras. I reckon. I mean, it's it's the most amazing product. It's super cheap. Find a good butcher and you can get it for... You get that and put it in the oven oh. and, and smear it over toasted bread. Mm. You eat bone marrow for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because it's just delicious. Mm. Um, so it, basically, what we've done... 
the other, the other great thing to do is, is to get is to get flour, so cut into gnocchi-sized pieces, get flour, um, double coated in flour, and then fry it in a pan. And it'll go crunchy on the outside. And when you burst into it, it'll be all melty and jellied. It's unbelievable. So just pop that out. I've soaked it in water overnight because you just want to get that blood out. You just want to get the, the blood. And obviously, like with the ones I've done now, I popped them out this morning and then just been soaking in water all day. So you extract, extract that, the, blood, the blood out of it. And then we've lightly smoked it just before. I didn't want to do it because the alarms might go off. And so, we're just, so you smoked in a pan like a yeah, like, just like, like literally like yeah. we got like a, a gastro and I got some. Well, obviously we're using maple syrup in that, so I got some maple chips. Right. Um, so so you, you heated the maple chips up and just bit, literally covered it with the bone marrow. Yeah. So you, I just these are f I brought these from Club Chef this morning in Northcote, and you can just you can sp I can go through it actually. It's quite easy. So you toast the toast the chips off in a pan, and then you'll see it'll start to obviously smoke because they're dry wood chips, and you can just if you got it in a pan, you can sort of kick it to the side, and what we did, we just line the bone marrow inside, cover it with foil, put it to the side. Mm. That's it. Um, so we're looking at two two fruits, so we're looking at blood oranges, and we're also looking at rhubarb. Love so, rhubarb. So who, who's a rhubarb fan here? Oh, look at that! I love it. Love my it. kind of people. Um, it's the best. Sweet. So what I'll do is I'll start with a curd. We'll put something else up. So the curd, really simple. I'm gonna the recipe in the, in the little book you've got there is how to make it on a stove. So for you easy guys to do it at home. I'm gonna do it in this fancy little version of a thermomix um, from Harvey Norman. So this could be fun. So yeah, these are, you can buy these in the store actually. Um, so I've got a little feather blade in there. So this is like a robo, like a normal processor, but it's temperature gauged. It's quite quite fancy you can cook like stew you can cook stew soups uh, well, well, is, that, is that is that got is that a graduated temperature gauge or can you actually set it for 63 degrees or yeah, yeah you can. so unlike the thermo which you can only do in 10, 10 degree increments with I the think, old ones i think this might be five in five minutes five, five five degrees okay so what we're going to do it's a bit fancy um we're going to get whole eggs i'm going to pop, pop them straight in the juice, so basically juice the blood oranges. I'm doing this with just oranges, and the recipe says oranges, but what you're eating tonight is blood oranges. Um, so I've just got the whole eggs in there. I'm going to add the juice. And what we're going to do, add a little bit of sugar, sugar. With this dish, I want you to think flavors in the mouth. I want you to feel different layers. So on the bottom, you're going to have a, a sour curd. Then on top of that, you're going to have some rhubarb poached in apple cider. Right, so then you get the, the acid of the cider. Then on top of that, you're going to have a creaminess of yogurt. And then on top, you're going to have something fresh with the milk snow. So you've got layers all, all integrated into one, which will, should leave you with a nice, nice little flavor in your mouth. So I generally do this by... The, in the sugar in there, it's basically I've cut the normal sugar level in half because I don't want this sweet at all. I'm looking for a, a nice tart, you know, tart curd. So I've got the eggs in there and the juice. In with the sugar. Pop the lid on. I'm going to set that at 80 degrees. So when you're doing ice creams or curds, you want to bring your yolks to 80 degrees. Because what that does, you're cooking out that egginess, and then you get the natural thickness of the yolks. You get the maximum thickness out of the yolks, bringing it to 80. So 80 degrees, and it cooks it out, cooks it out nice. So I'm going to put that on for... 20 minutes on a just an average speed and basically just let that go I might turn it up a little bit we don't even need the processor and very impressive yeah and then you just walk away have a beer and um, come back to it when it's done and that and that will just go off when it stops so what are we going to do next alright so that's ticking along it's got 9 minutes to go alright I'm going to show you how to do the rhubarb so everyone loves rhubarb so I just I w when I sort of come up with this I sort of want the different flavors and stuff. So what I've done is just peel the rhubarb down, taking the outside of the skin off, and you kept the skin, keep the skin. Brett Graham taught me a thing where, where's all your flavor and where's all your nutrients? In the skin. So when I make purees and stuff, I leave the skin on. 
is he going to get those natural nutrients and everything in the vegetable? Like, why peel it away? What are you going to do with it? You're going to throw it in the bin. Most of like utilize it in making like a little stock syrup or you know enhance the flavour. So what I've done is just peeled it down, kept these, and what we're going to do, I'm going to crank this up, and I've just got some just some apple cider. And what we're going to do, we're going to bring that to the boil and just boil just boil that initial alcohol. And when that's just boiled for about a minute, we want to hit it with a little bit of verjuice. So verjuice is, does anyone know what verjuice is? Yeah, it's just obviously premium, premium for wine. So we've just got a little bit of that. So we're going to boil that, hit it with a bit of verjuice, add the skins in. Oh, let's add the skins in now. So add the skins in. So bring that to the boil, hit it with verjuice. We'll have a little taste. Obviously everything's about tasting and see where it's all at have all the taste and then we'll add a little bit of sugar if we need to but we should get the natural sugars from the cider and the verjuice and the skins so really this sort of component there should be no sugar because you're relying off the natural sugars in the in, in the fruit to come out all right sweet so that's just come to the boil so just you know boil that alcohol out a bit it's gonna add a little bit of verjuice it's so probably like a, quick, a cup cup and a half we'll bring that back up and what I'll do, I'll strain that into that, put that back in, add the rhubarb, and just lightly, just on a simmer, just cook it through. I like it, I don't like mushy rhubarb. I like it with a little bit of texture. So I'm gonna strain that off now. So that's all the peel. I'm gonna add this back in now. Who have you learnt the most? You've worked with Matt Moran, you've worked with um, Brett Graham, you've worked with Heston, you've worked with Josh Emmett at Mays. Um, who have you learnt the most from? Who's been the, who's been the biggest influence? Scott Pickett, obviously, as well. Yeah, well, oh, I'd have to be Bretto. Um, Brett's been, I think, a uh, major inf influence on me over the past well, three, three and a half years that I've let, left there. Um, just his philosophy of food. And he's just, just a nice guy. He's a dude. So, um, you know, he'll, he'll come into the kitchen one day with two chickens hanging by the side of his side. And be like, oh, look what I got. And he'll just slap him on the bench and the boys will just start prepping it. But, like, you know, you might have a rough night. You'll go down. You'll break. You'll start crying, which I did probably uh, several times. And because I'm a bit of a wimp like that. Um, and then Bretto, you just pull you aside and have a chat and be like, you're smashing it. Don't worry about it, you know. All right, right so, so what have you got? Um... So what I've done, just... That's finished poaching now. It doesn't take long. Probably like five, six minutes, I would say. And what I've done, this is how we're going to prep it on the dessert. Who's made a panna cotta before? Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. So this is a panna cotta. All right, cool. So what I've done in there, put the yogurt, the sugar, and in your recipe it says it'll be with lemons. I don't have any lemons here today. Um, so basically just going to cook that sugar out. Bring it up, just do like a light simmer, just cook out the sugar. And then after that, we're going to take it off. We're going to let it just chill naturally. And when it gets to about room temp, so you can just make that and then do other things while you're sort of creating. Let it set. Add the gelatin. Stir that in. Then add the yogurt. So basically, you can see there, we've got the curd, we've got the rhubarb, we've got the cream. And then over the top, which you can see in your recipe book as well, is a milk snow. So to make it real simple, it's a grin, essentially a granita. So, but what I've done is jazzed up and made it a little bit easier instead of grating it with a fork. Is we at work we have a packo jet, so I just set it in a packo jet and then blitz it. Do you, do you, you don't get the you don't get the graininess you don't get the gr the graininess of the um the milk the milk solids. No, because we we to make it, you bring it to the boil, and, and so therefore you might yeah, okay. cooking it out, and then. Mm, look at that. And that will be your dessert for this evening. Oh, that looks fantastic. Well done. That's fantastic, Jake. Thank you.